The 33rdteam.com is your must follow for everything going on in the NFL today with videos and analysis from current players as well as former players, coaches, and NFL execs. It will change the way you see the game. Plus, you can use the edge, football's most powerful and informative interactive tool to guide all your fantasy decisions and wagers. And it's 100% free. Find them online at the 33rd team.com. Hey, everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. Before I get to today's rock star guest, I just want to draw attention to my website, www.markpattersonnfl.com. There's a lot of things you can get there, one of, of which are more podcasts. I've done over 275 of these things of amazing people doing incredible feats. And we're going to have a really fascinating conversation today. But love if everybody would go in and give a ratings and review on Apple, it helps elevate the popularity of the show. And don't we all need to be inspired? Certainly I do. Number two, uh, uh, anybody who has not seen Searching for the Summit, the Best Picture Award winning Emmy uh, that the NFL did on my Everest journey, you can find that on there as well. And finally, love and continue to draw interest to my uh, philanthropy, Amelia's Everest, everything goes to Higher Ground, which is an organization here in Sun Valley, Idaho, also in New York, in LA. It's all about the empowerment of others, and we continue to raise funds, certainly well over 100 grand now. So proud of that fact. So, uh, on that note, I want to jump into today's cool guest. I've known this guy from afar from a long time. We used to play against each other. Um, and then this last weekend, I had a great opportunity to meet him in person, one of my favorite guys there. His name is Mike Tomzik. Mike, how you doing? Very well. Well, Mark, good afternoon. Yeah, yeah, you uh, you kind of bounced in and out of there on the on the on the Wi-Fi, but I think we're back. But um, look, uh, this last week, uh, you and I were uh, graciously invited to go play in a golf tournament um, on the East Coast. Um, I flew across the country and you flew probably down or across or I'm not sure how you got there. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of wonderful people that were there to really help raise money and awareness for certain causes. A lot of those guys were NFL players. And, you know, what a a cool thing when, um, you know, and it usually happens this way where quarterbacks and receivers always find a way to kind of gravitate towards each other. But how I knew you is back in the day, we played roughly about the same time. I played for the University of Washington, and you played for the, I think that's how you say it, Ohio State. You were a quarterback there. You did quite well. But but what was that like growing up for you? I know you grew up in Illinois, but what was that like for you growing up, you know, in kind of a really hotbed of of that whole Ohio, Illinois, that whole area? What was that like for you? Uh, The best. The best. My father was a high school football coach, and, you know, I kind of – when I came out of the womb, I kind of fell into a ball bag, if you will. And, you know, the Big Ten was the Big Ten back then. You had your t- 10 prominent teams. And my dad was a popular high school football coach in the Chicagoland area. And I worked camps. I went to camps, you know, throughout the Big Ten. I went to Purdue, went to Illinois, went to Indiana, uh, pretty much. And I didn't go to Ohio State, didn't know much about Ohio State because I grew up. <laughs> I grew up a Michigan fan. I kind of choked when I said that, but I grew up a Michigan fan, uh, you know, throughout my whole childhood. And a few players that played for my dad in high school ended up playing for Michigan. So there was a likeness. Uh, our rival high school had the scarlet and gray colors. So, you know, obviously there was a dislike there just from a high school standpoint. But, you know, it it was so much better back then than it is now. The traditions, the pageantry, everything you would think of when you chose your university that really filtered through your soul. And I said earlier, I had a dislike for Ohio state just based on the colors because it was a rival high school, but not until I got on campus, as you probably experienced Mark, you know, you felt that vibe, you know, you growing up where you grew up in Northern California, I believe, you know, there was a likeness to a lot of PAC 10 schools and, 
gosh, you know, I never thought I'd be playing at Ohio State. And then when I started getting recruited, it was like, you know, I can see myself here, you know, 80,000 people, you know, and I was just like a little ant in a farm hill, if you will. And, you know, when I got there, the awareness of how big and the magnitude of football was in Ohio really hit me because there was a quarterback that you might have known of, Art Schleister, mm. that played for the Buckeyes, uh, you know, perennial All-American. And he set a lot of records at Ohio State. And the guy that had to replace him was me, or I had an opportunity to replace him mm. along with four other guys. And that'd be like, you know, replacing Don James at Washington as the head coach or, you know, Warren Moon, for example. But it was just awesome. You know, I, 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 someday I'm going to write it down in the book, if you will, just my the authenticity of what I knew. I had Big Ten calendars and posters in my room. And, you know, I just – the flags, you know, I knew about Northwestern. I knew about Illinois. I knew about Indiana and Purdue. And they were within a couple-hour radius of my hometown. So it was uh, – I pinched myself to even know that I even played in the Big Ten and played at a high level. You played at a very, very high level. I know you took uh, the team to the Rose Bowl. Um, it might have been your senior year. We actually lost in, I'm not sure if it was the 84, uh, because it's always, it always, obviously, you're playing right. on, on New Year's Day. So I don't, was it the, the, the year, calendar year 84, or was it actually the 83 season? It was the 84 calendar. Well, it was 85, January 1st, correct? 84 season. Yeah. So we. USC, we yeah. Yeah, you played USC, and we had lost USC, or only we lost the uh, the year. We were ranked number one most of that year. We ended up in in uh, Miami playing Oklahoma. We beat Oklahoma, and that was really the launch of of this whole BCS thing about who should be number one. Because who ended up number one, if you recall, the way back then was BYU. So how do yeah. you take a, a a team in the lesser conference? You're not playing Ohio State, and USC, and UCLA, and Michigan. You know you're you're playing Boise States of the world and Montana States, right? So it's a whole different animal, um, as you know. And so they ended up number one, but out of that came this whole change. And ultimately it is what it is today. And now it's a whole four team playoff, which I think is probably going to be expanding. You know, as you go, you know, you mentioned an interesting name, Arch Schleister, and I do remember him not so much about his quarterbacking, um, but more for the gambling he got caught up in once he got into the NFL. And so, it's an unfortunate thing that helped. It really tarnished his career. But, you know, you obviously did something right to go in there and win that job and and then go on into the NFL. So let's move on in, in into that. Um, surprisingly to me, you you and I were probably at the combines together, um, but you 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 get drafted. Actually, you don't get drafted. So you go in as a free agent. So, so it's hard enough. I was just on another podcast a few months ago, and we were talking about making the NFL. And I said, you know, look, I would have loved to have a 16-year NFL career, which you ultimately had. I had a five-year, but it's one thing to to make it. It's a whole different animal to stay there, right? With all the movement and everybody's going around, there's always you know, trying to everybody's trying to make their team better. Um, but what mountain was that like for you going on to that Bears team, which then you go on to win the Super Bowl in your rookie year? Crazy. Yeah, very crazy. But let's back up. You know, talking about the combine and happened out in Phoenix there. You know, actually, Tepe. That's right. And I was the la last entry into that uh, combine. I look to my right. I, I go through the physicals. And when I get on the field, finally, I got a receiver to my right and a receiver to my left. And the dude to my right was a guy named Jerry Rice. Yeah. From Mississippi Valley State. Yep. Which I never heard of. And then Andre Reed from Coonstown State was to my left. 20 years later, these guys are in the Hall of Fame. They were drafted. I was a free agent. Not that I got them drafted, you know, first or in the first round, but, you know, just to take you back to where we were at that juncture. And now the combine now is a lot grandiose and a lot of lights, camera, action. But, uh, you know, to make that team, you know, historically, the Bears only kept two quarterbacks, you know, on their roster. And that particular year, McMahon had an injury in 84, and Steve Fuller ended up playing in the uh, NFC Championship game against San Francisco, which the Bears got beat. And that year, they brought in five quarterbacks. They have Steve Fuller, McMahon, myself, a guy named uh, Rusty Lish from Notre Dame, and a guy named Ken Cruz from Illinois. So I'm thinking, okay, I got one in a fifty, one one out of five chance to make this team. I was the last player that made that team that year, Mark. And mm. by the grace of God, 
you know, Dick had saw something in me, the organization saw something in me, but there was a coach on that staff at that time that I went all the way back to high school with a guy named Ted Plum. Talk about relationships. He and my dad were good friends because they worked at camp for 10 years together. And he knew about my growth through grade school, high school, and then obviously at Ohio State. And he probably put a vote in for me at that 11 o'clock hour. Hey, you need any free agents? You know, we got Tom Zach here from Ohio State. We got Cruz that, you know, but well, he brought me in and, you know, I took advantage of the opportunity. And little did I know that I would find my summit temporarily for a decade and a half and experience the highs and the lows of professional athletics and, you know, quarterbacking, uh, being on the Super Bowl team your rookie year, and then going on and playing 15 years after that. And it was, it was something that, um, you know, I, I went through a lot. I went through a big growth period between my senior year in college and my rookie year in the NFL. And I give a lot of gratitude and thanks to Jim McMahon, who we both know. You know, he's got to play uh, football in the National Football League, a caricature, but a tremendous teammate. He taught me so much about the game of football from an intellectual standpoint, you know, the cerebral part, you know, the football IQ, because at Ohio State, we would only throw on second down or maybe play action on first down and then third in the bus ride. We do play action pass, you know, turn our back to the line of scrimmage and very seldom will we in the shotgun. So, you know, that helped my growth and also just the opportunity. You know, I, I believed in myself a lot. I put a lot into it. I was a gym rat. I threw a lot of footballs. I prepared myself. I played three sports and I was highly competitive. And, you know, I just needed a chance. And it was a kind of a boyhood dream, if you will. Yeah, I had another guy in my pod, Mark Wilson, who is a Raider quarterback, and I do some work with his company now. But yeah. he had said the same thing when we were kind of reliving his his glory years back in, in college. And he had a really unique thing because I think as a sophomore, uh, Mark had set records uh, all over, uh, you know, in the NCAA that year. And then he got hurt. And then Jim McMahon did this guy exact and was player of the conference that year. And then the next year, Mark got hurt and Jim played the whole year. And then he did the, basically the same thing that Mark did his sophomore year. Then Mark comes back his senior year, wins the job back. And, and so there's this kind of seesaw thing, but he said he was the best teammate when he was going through that. And, and that's a hard thing to do when you're, you're both competing for a job and you both yeah. want that thing and to be super supportive of each other. So that's good on you. And it, and it serves you well. And it probably has served you well in life in terms of things don't always go your way. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but they are to be with a positive mindset, cheer others on and be grateful can take you a long way in life. And those are all good lessons. Well, I fight greed every day. <laughs> you know, there's temptations and there's times when, you know, you're trying to carry out that commandment, you know, love thy neighbor. Mm -hmm. And I re kind of go back mentally, you know, how good of a teammate was I or, or could I have been? And I think. You know, without uh, patting myself on the back, you know, when I got into that huddle, Mark, I mean, when I, I had the eyes, you know, I, I had 20 eyes staring at me. I had the respect of those guys. And because I loved them and they knew I was going to give my best effort. And I encouraged them throughout practice. And even when I was the backup on the sideline, I would encourage those guys, you know, keep on fighting, keep on doing your job. Things are going to work out. And it worked out for me because it was reciprocated. And as we fast forward through life, you know, I believe my I'm in the help business. I love to help people. You know, I, I do some industrial maintenance stuff. I do some volunteer work in football. I do some volunteer work raising money for the foundation here at Youngstown State. So, you know, all my life, I watched through my father's, through my eyes, what my father would do. He would always be helping somebody else. And I guess, you know, our calling is to be servants of others. And part of that is being a great teammate. And it was tough at times because I thought it was a better, better dude, right? I mean, you probably felt, you know, give me just, I'm better than that dude. Yeah. <laughs> but just put me in. Yeah. You know, you just got to wait your turn and, and just, you know, good things happen to those who wait sometimes. But if you wait too long, you might not get that chance, right? Yeah. And I, and I, I seem to think of this as, <laughs> I think, in order to have success in a certain sport, and you can pick any one of them and that's out there, anywhere from, you know, gymnastics to tennis, to, to more organized sports like football or basketball or baseball, that you have to have some kind of athletic arrogance. And that doesn't mean that you're arrogant. It just means that you know your craft and you're confident in what you can do. And you know that you're better than the next guy. And you have to walk in. And if you know 
once that confidence leaves the train station, your career is over in the NFL. And that's just the way it goes. So you end up playing with a number of different teams, the Green Bay Packers, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, of course, the Bears, we were talking about the Browns. Um, and you look back on your 16 years, and you've already kind of mentioned some of these different things, but you know, the 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 relationships and and all the different experiences that you had just goes into this bank of 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 gratitude and it sounds like from everything you're saying you've been able to to like convert that now to being a servant to others but are there are there besides we already talked about Jimmy McMahon but are there any other things of the NFL like it, it, when you sum it up like you look back on it and and that experience gave me blank you know it gave me more this or that or it can be anything it, can, it doesn't have to be anything but it just seems like it, it's, I mean, it was more than a decade for you of being involved yeah. at the highest level. It's amazing. It is. It's really amazing. And it drove me to the sofa. You know, I went through depression, you know, like, like most Americans do. If you, if you yeah. say you've never been depressed, I think you're lying. Uh, and I, it was a great thing to go through, uh, through all the, through all the triumphs and tribulations. Uh, there's a human being behind the skin. You know, all the pats on the back and you want to conduct the orchestra, but you got to turn your back to the crowd. And sometimes that was hard to do in Chicago, being a hometown kid, being my family. I had a large family. I have five siblings. Uh, Parents were running a health club business. My dad was still coaching football. And, you know, our name was a good name on the south side of Chicago. So, you know, I, I bared a lot of their emotions because they always asked how I was doing. And I was fine. You know, I, I had wet wings, you know, I, I would, the water would just come off my wings. But it got to the point where Mike Ditka, you know, that one game, man, that one game, you know, I lost it against the New England Patriots. And I was in 1987. I was ready to just walk away. I mean, it was, you know, yo-yo in and out of the game. And I think a lot of your listeners, Mark, can identify with this is with their coworkers or their mentors or their bosses were you know, they're growling at you, but they're wagging their tail at the same time. And you, you don't know which end to believe because there's a disconnect, you know, and, and things are lost in translations. But, you know, I had to go through that to be the person I am today. And, and I had to look at myself and say, was I being greedy? You know, was I being, you know, not accountable to myself? You know, I was saying yes to everyone and I should have been saying no at times because I was that local kid. So, you know, I experienced that, but the triumphs, I mean, you know, Walter Payton, you know, 23 years ago yesterday, he passed away mm. and he was impactful in my life. I met him in 1976 at the college all-star training camp up at Northwestern University. And then nine years later, I'm handing off to him, you know, and I get the chance to spend three years with him, you know, playing professional football and Jay Hilgenberg, you know, great teammate, great compadre. We experienced a lot in life together, not only in the football field, but off it you know, through our experiences through marriage and setbacks and divorces and raising a family. So, you know, probably the last gentleman, uh, Jim Lachey, my college roommate, mm. you know, he was a small time kid that was just a big, lovely human being. And to this day, we're, we're very close and we share a lot of family memories together, raising our kids around each other. So, you know, outside of the professional side, uh, you know, I got people, you know, from my professional life and you know after football you know whether it be in broadcasting or steel industry or industrial maintenance you know people i can trust and and rely on they look at me as a person not the personality if you will and yeah. i like that <laughs> no it's great to be because like you said you, you take the armor off and you come out of the gladiator ring and we're just like everybody else and 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 part of those things you know like you said you have your ups and your downs um you know i and i'm going to ask you this question back but Ten years ago, roughly, I went through a tough time in my personal life. I went through a divorce, and that that really forced me to uh, go through some tough times. And like you said, the depression part of it—I'm not sure what end of the rung. Like you, I would, but I was not a happy guy. I mean, I'm not sure where I fell on that whole spectrum. But what it did make me do um, is is question like where I was going in my life and how I was going to internalize that. And, 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 it, what, and what spit out on the other side was for me to create this massive goal of trying to become the first NFL player to climb the seven summits. Right. And it, it gave me something to look forward to. 
it gave me a day-to-day goal of exercising and you know what it was going to take to climb these crazy mountains and learn the skill of mountaineering and especially high high mountaineering um uh, and, and so putting that back for you and, and by the way that 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 whole thing just ended uh in terms of that particular goal last um uh, may may 21st and then we had the film that came out but but back back to you you went through something somewhat similar and and what was that thing for you that helped kind of pull you out of where you were to where you are today? I think going through the adversity, without a doubt. You know, I didn't. I left this out on purpose because I know we kind of revisit it. You know, mm-hmm. there comes a point in your life where, you know, somebody tells you you can't do something, and you get pissed off, and you get that chip on your shoulder, and you get gritty. And uh, right before my senior year of college, we had a spring football game. And during that game, I broke my leg in two places prior to the season, my senior year. And for the first time I ever saw my dad cry in front of me. Here I am, 21 years young and laying on the turf at Ohio Stadium. And I have a spiral fracture of my tibia and a fractured fibula. And they tell me I'd never be able to play football again because the surgery, we couldn't get a rod down there. Long story short, I was back in three and a half months. And I trained my ass off. And when Earl Bruce came in that hospital room, the next day and said, Michael, you want to coach? I heard you never, never be able to play football again. And I just said, get the F out of here. <laughs> I said, I'm not ready for this. Uh, so, you know, I, I think God puts us in places that allows us, you know, some setbacks or adversities or hiccups, if you will. And that, but allows us great opportunity to grow. I mean, you and I face some, you know, some marital setbacks that in some people's eyes, you know, they look at you as you lost that battle. You know, I didn't think I lost that, but I gained from it. You know, even though I was self- dying in self-pity and everything, um, I rose above the ashes because I had a family to raise, let alone keep myself alive and be there for my children. So, the, you know, the adversity of breaking a leg, you know, taught me you got to fight through it. You got to grit through it. And then my personal life, I get to that point in my life where here's the real challenge. I mean, this ain't no dress rehearsal, right? I mean, this is live. We're not, this is not a second take or a third take. And it was a great example for my kids. My kids are older now, and they appreciated that. They they revert back to it in letters to me that they're so thankful of those times together and those precious moments. And, you know, they just wish they could have been around when I was playing. And my career ended against the Oakland Raiders in Alameda County Stadium, mm. where I broke my le- same leg on that grass dirt infield. And that was a sign from above after 16 years in the preseason, third game, starting quarterback, you know, boom, it was time to go. And, you know, my kids were two and four at the time and just moved my wife to Detroit. She said, you know, we need, we belong in Pittsburgh. So we moved back there and started our own life together. And it was good for a while. It was good yeah. for a while. Well, life happens to everybody. And, you know, here's the, here's the thing too, which I've come to finally figure out, which is, a lot of times when we all go through the, these rough patches, whether you're, you know, this is for a job or it's your personal situation or something is happening to somebody else that's close to you, uh, that, that you know, there's this period of time that it takes for you to, like, weave and navigate your way through all this. But if you can look 10 years back, like 10 years forward now for me to look 10 years back, it was the best thing. It was a blessing. I couldn't see that at the time. It was a disaster and everything else at the time, you know, coming out of the NFL, like, okay, now what? And today they've done such a great job. Tracy Perlman, who, you know, she's done such yep. a great job of, of setting up all these different programs that are out there for NFL, ex NFL players to like transition into a new career back then. It was just like, okay, where are we going now? And no clue. Right. And trying to figure that out. But again, Looking back on that now, it it also helped set me up for where I sit today with Sports Illustrated and things like that. And so, you know, from my my from my personal relationships, for my Seven Summit mountaineering pursuits, for my for my uh, occupation, um, it, you know, it's all served me because, like you were saying before, you've turned a negative into a positive, and that net net has made you grow in time, and better things have come your way. You talked about life after football for you. You've been involved in some different things, some some charities, mm-hmm. some different businesses and things mm-hmm. like that. The thing that was most fascinated 
when you and I were hanging out um, last week was this whole connection that you have of all places, Young's, Youngstown, right? Mm -hmm. And it's somewhere mm -hmm. out in Pennsylvania there. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just, so can you tell us more about what you're doing, what your connection is with that university? Absolutely. Uh, Youngstown, Ohio is 50 miles northwest of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and about 70 miles due east of Cleveland, Ohio. So it sits right off the turnpike between New York, then it goes uh, Pittsburgh, Youngstown, Cleveland, Chicago. That's kind of the route, you know, the thoroughfare, if you will. And I've been here for six years now. I've been part of the university more full, not full time, but uh, as a consultant, if you will, on their foundation side. Uh, President Tressel, who was my position coach at Ohio State for my last two years, has been uh, extremely influential in my life um, during that rough time. You know, when I got separated from, from my marriage and, you know, he was there for me, you know, 22 years later to say, hey, you want to talk? <laughs> you know, and fast forward, here we are, 2016, 17. He says, I think you belong up here. You know, I was transitioning out of the steel industry. I wanted to help out more uh, philanthropically and raise money for a cause. And it seemed like Youngstown State was the place for me. And, you know, here's a guy that, uh, I, I, you know, I got articles of Trestle because he's retiring after uh, nine years here as president of the university. One of the only presidents that does not have a doctorate degree for university. And he's just a wonderful human being. And, and you know, I, I see a lot of likeness of him and me because of like minds attract, right, if you will. And so I've been doing that. I've been helping out with the football team on a volunteer basis. I'm the advisor to the head coach here, Doug Phillips. We are currently five and three in the Missouri Valley Football Conference. We are traveling to uh, Illinois State this weekend on a three-game winning streak. And our quarterbacks are playing pretty well. Uh, I happen to sit in the rooms every day with those young men and listen to them file things away in their hippocampus and try to recall things when the plays come in. And, you know, it's exciting. It keeps me young, keeps me involved. And also the community work I do here, I'm involved with adults with autism here in the Youngstown, Pittsburgh area. Mm. Uh, my family always had a likeness towards handicapped people. And I've carried on the tradition. I've been involved with that for a number of years now. And you know, uh, for some reason, I did. There's an attraction attraction to that. I I love people, all shapes and sizes, and God has been good to me. Uh, he's challenged me to be a better servant, and you know, even the fact you know we ran into each other in the hallway, you know, right in front of the elevator, and it was like, hey, you're supposed to run a curl on that route. No, no, no I signaled you a quick out. You know, what are you talking about? They're playing cover two. You got to get in that get in that hole shot there. Yeah. But you know, it's. <clears throat> it, it, it's nice. I, this is where I belong. I really do. There's some wonderful people who come in my life recently here in the Youngstown area, and President Trussell is one of them again. That's great. That's great. I mean, community is so important. And it, it is interesting, like the arc of life, right, where you start and you're pursuing things and you're just out for you. And then that kind of transitions over time. And it's just really more about others and how you can serve and really counting your blessings and being grateful for the things that you have around you in your day-to-day -day life. And, you know, as yeah. we, as we, I don't know if we're around in third base or we're in between second and third right now, but however you want yeah. to phrase that, um, you know, we should be in a place in our lives because we're the same age where, you know, your life is filled with joy and happiness and you're doing the things that you want to do in life to deliver on those different things. And, and if you're not there and if you're somebody listening to this podcast right now, you know, you got to really sit down and, and, and write your vision board. Like, where do you want to be? And I know that's what you've done, Mike, over the, over your, your time of, of the goals that you've set and the things that you've accomplished is creating that vision board and always striving to go in that direction. And it's a lot easier to be pulled in that direction where you don't have all this negative weight on you. Absolutely. You know, you say that vision board, you know, the subliminal mind, you know, it's, I find this, and I don't know if it's like-minded with you, when you get around former teammates, whether it be high school, college, or professional, your neurons are heightened. <clears throat> 
you know, and you recall things, you know, and I don't know if it's, if it's just this connection you have with these hippo campuses coming together and, you know, you share those stories. Hey, I remember it was the, you ran that dig route and you got whacked on that play. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't have led you in there, you know. It's, yeah. So you have these these moments. But, you know, my subliminal mind, you know, as much as people talk about writing things down, I think I write with my mind more than I do with my hand. You know, I see things. I'm, I'm a visionary guy that, you know, sees the good in people, you know, and I because I challenge myself, you know, daily because it's so easy to turn that cheek and say, I'm not, you know, in today's society, Mark, I mean, you know, people are cautious. I mean, it is a violent, brutal world out there if you want to succumb to that, right? But I choose to live in my world where I see happiness and jo- more joy than anything because happiness is fleeting. You know, one guy could be happy today and, you know, he looks at the stock market and his whole attitude changes, right? You know, based on one day. So, yeah. you know, rightfully so, you know, I, 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 being around young student athletes, being around, you know, kids that are my kids' age, I draw from that. I draw parallels to see where my children are at. And it's a selfish thing for a parent, but we always try to see, gauge where our kids are at, right? You know, how about when we were in college? You know, our eyes were bug eyes, right? I mean, you know, I was walking around with 50,000 students. I mean, 50,000 yeah. humans. Yeah. <laughs> you know? What are they thinking? Let alone, you know, that Tom Zach sucks, man. He played terrible against Stanford. You know, <laughs> I was one of the people booing him out of the stadium. And, you know, it's just one of those things where if I could be an example to my children that later on in life, I could sit around as a grandfather and say, you know what? Life's work is good. I'm at peace. I think that's a great way to end it, man. Uh, I so appreciate you coming on and uh, you're doing great work. And I look forward to seeing it more events out into the future yeah. it's gonna be really yeah. cool to uh have a couple familiar faces out there and certainly you're one of them so uh so on that note thank you so much you were great and uh you know it's just it's an honor to uh to get to know you a little bit better likewise i wish you well and i was uh 10 minutes into your nfl uh release that uh actually i found it on new orleans saints website mm-hmm. and i love it and the testimony I got to Jim Moore when he was talking about carrying the hardest challenge for you is is going climbing up up the mountain with yeah. all that weight and balancing. Yeah. And as you recited, it's like running back to back marathons. Yeah. I mean, I'm in your huddle, man. I'm ready to lift you up and be <laughs> part of part of that wind that gets you there. But congrats uh, yeah. and and you're you're gonna be a good friend. We're gonna have a lot of time together. All right. I wish Mike. you well. All right, everybody. All right. There he is, the one, the only Mike Tomzak. Thank you.